So I'm not really French, okay? I'm French, uh, half French and half Romanian. I was, um, it's interesting because I started my career in, uh, in advertising, as Chris mentioned. I was with uh, YNR for a couple of years during my student life in Bucharest, and I loved it. And then, uh, then I moved to France, and um, uh, after my school in Paris, I did three years of QBCs. Um, so this is kind of the continuation of the head, uh, the head experience. And then I moved into consulting afterwards. And but uh, it's interesting what Chris was mentioning because on once, uh, you know, for five, five years I was doing advertising, so I was on the on the good side of the of the career. And uh, for another seven years I did audits and consulting. And a uh, big chunk of this time was auditing advertising agencies for for the on behalf of clients. So uh, I was the best guy going to Kenya and auditing TBWA uh, for. And why not for uh, for Coke and identifying things that agencies don't do well. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm not going to get into details in this because this was the past. But um, but over the past uh, I would say past four years, I started a number of uh, I started my real entrepreneurial adventure um, after my MBA in the US, and um, I started with building building companies. A lot of them in the e-commerce field. Um, so I just wanted to share with you, I mean, Chris invited me here to, uh, to share a bit of my experience in how to build uh, fast but also sustainable companies, mainly uh, in a continent where you know, entrepreneurial is life is, uh, and ventures are great, but it's a continent which is not easy to build, to build business. Probably you see that from your, your, your customers, your clients as well. And um, just a quick... Uh, a quick uh, map of the world in companies which uh, either started or I was uh, involved in early stage. Um, the first, uh, the first very entrepreneurial adventure was a company which, which I started in South Africa with two of my classmates from uh, from my MBA in New York, uh, which is currently Group One. Uh, we started a company uh, in 2000 and, uh, early 2010, which was called Twangu. Sold seven months later to Groupon, and uh, it is currently Groupon South Africa. This was kind of the start of, of building a retail, but also a, it's a retail venture finally, in a, in a country <coughs> where internet was very, very unutilized at the time. Uh, it was literally years and a half or years ago. And uh, from this, I joined a, I joined a company called Rocket Internet, which was the, the builder of, which was behind Groupon, one of the early investors of Groupon Global. And, uh, and rocket to rocket, I started to launch companies around the world. I went to Russia and I started a company called Amola, which is very simple to, you may know Zando here, right? A fashion retailer. Um, and then after three months in Moscow, we you know, hired people, started the processes, built the first 40 people team. I moved to Berlin, and it was the early time where Rocket was looking into what other models can be can be launched, and they liked very much Airbnb, which you may know, which is a peer-to-peer -peer accommodation. And uh, we copied Airbnb, and we launched a company called Windu, which became global in, in less than six months. There were like 40 offices launched around the world, and I was in charge of uh, the Berlin office for the first couple of months, and then I went to China, and we launched uh, a version of Windu in Beijing. And this was a rather interesting thing because uh, you know, China is a very complicated market. You know, Chinese don't speak English. Chinese don't. You know, you know how Airbnb does, right? Works, right? You know, I have a flat in Cape Town. You come from London. You stay in my place because you like to. You know, you don't want to stay in a hotel, and then you want to meet locals, etc. And vice versa. Well, the problem in, in uh, the problem in uh, China is that uh, you know our German investors told us just go to go to Beijing and launch launch Wind in three weeks. Without, no, without any kind of prior market study, and then we realize in China that Chinese do not Chinese do not stay at other people's place, places. <laughs> they do not, I, I haven't been invited for dinner or even for a drink or coffee with any Chinese person in my six months in China. So, so we realize that after a month, after building the website, after starting to get you know flats, apartments on our website, and the people are just not booking. Then we realized that we had to change completely this model. And uh, we went into actually renting out 
uh, available uh, partners in town. <coughs> but the model is totally different from you know from peer to peer, where you come for you know to spend some cool time at someone else's place into a pure rental rental business. And then um, um, I was involved with um, in early stage. I started another company called My Luxbox, um, in China and Hong Kong, and um, this was a, a, a subscription business model uh, for beauty products. Just kind of uh, you may know Rubybox here, they do a similar thing. And uh, we launched uh, with a team, uh, uh, we launched Australia and uh, Middle East and Dubai and Brazil with, uh, with, uh, with a version of this uh, My Luxbox called Glambox. And then, um, and then I came to South Africa uh, years ago and uh, also for Rocket Internet and uh, same thing, uh, we look into the fashion market and we say whether it's the fashion online retail is great, it's a great category, super unutilized, what we do first, let's launch Zando. So I launched Zando here back in uh, exactly two years, two years ago. And um, same thing in just like three weeks uh, we we built a team of uh, 25 people, and uh, we start selling. And then um, after Zando, I launched another company called Five Rooms uh, four months later, uh, which uh, was a retailer, uh, which is similar to IKEA, so retailer selling furniture and cool, cool homework stuff. Uh, and then uh, we raised a significant funding from Naspers, uh, and we uh, launched Style 36. I was actually the CEO of uh, the holding company uh, behind Style 36, which is uh, kind of very similar to Zando, uh, five rooms and, and a baby venture, a baby retail um, on a retailer called Tinderero. And uh, we uh, exited, um, so Nasbrus um, um, decided to uh, include all the, the other kind of verticals into Kalahari um, for consolidation and bigger power. So they bought us out, the minority stakeholders. And uh, I mean, recently, um, Starting to get, I mean, I've been financing uh, for a while a company called Pocket Plan, uh, which is an application for cool events happening in town. Uh, so it's like a to date more and later. It's like a Uber for events. And uh, I started actually a joint operation team uh, about a month ago. So, so it's a lot of things. Um, oh, I'm out. I forgot to mention, um, I was also involved in a very early stage of a company called Jumia, which is a which is an Amazon, like a Kalahari in, in Nigeria, Morocco, and they launched recently Uganda and, uh, and Ghana. Uh, but I was there, there in uh, kind of the day one for three months in Lagos uh, to give the team and to, to build the processes. So a lot of things uh, in, in probably uh, four, four and a half years. So the question, how, how did I manage to do that? And um, the way you do that is you need people. You can't do yourself everything, right? So people, in my experience, people is the uh, number one recipe for a successful business. I'll give you an example. The, word, uh, the, the way we launched, I launched Zando here. I was still in China, and uh, a month before landing in Cape Town, I started to LinkedIn for people. Uh, I, need, I knew exactly what I need to start a company. You need a platform, IT. Well, we were having a platform before, but you need people to buy products, buy fashion you know, brands from, from, uh, from suppliers. So you need buyers. You need marketers, yeah, you need to market your product. Uh, you need operations because you have to build a warehouse, so you need you know, good operation like a warehouse manager. You need data people, very important. You need data people who can start building the data structures behind, behind the company. Um, and, uh, and that's what you hire first. Yeah, so it's LinkedIn, calling, interviewing 10, 15 people a day over the phone. Yeah, so you already have 500 people, you interview 500 people, you get 100 people in your, on your short list, and you hire them. Yeah, that's kind of the... Uh, and you do that, you know, if you interview 15 people a day, you make a calculation, you need some time to, in the month to, uh, to be able to go through a lot of, a lot of profiles. But you get an idea. And um, the other thing, uh, how, how, when, what's the profile of those people? Uh, they should be young, entrepreneurial, risk takers. So how do you, how to get out a good buyer from Woolworths or from Tourworths who makes, you know, gazillions and then you know, after 10 years of, uh, of uh, buying experience, it's probably, you know, starting to be slow and not super entrepreneurial. You don't go there. Yeah. You get people who are low level, but who are hungry, they want to build something, and uh, like you guys, and, um, and they're not scared to, uh, to take risks. So they don't have many obligations, you know, you know big families and kids to, a lot of kids to feed, etc. So that's the profile of guys and, and, and guys and girls who, uh, who are hiring. 
And you know, we start. We started in a small office. We started from the group one office at a time on a desk like this, with five people around. And then we moved into a bigger office two weeks later, and that's how we started. Very similar to Nigeria. So when when we started Jumia in Lagos, so we took a plane from here. And uh, I just want to show you something interesting slide. When I landed in Lagos, when I landed in Lagos, I took a cab from the airport. That was myself and another guy, or my, my uh, co-founder in Rocket right here. And we're driving through kind of the town, and this was the first I took this picture. Because I said, how on earth, in this corner, can we open a, a Kalahari, I call it an Amazon, that was selling online fashion and electronics in a place which looks like a, like a market. It's not, not possible. So I was telling my, my, my friend, my partner uh, in, in the car, I said, man, we have, to, you know, we have to call the agency and book our flight back. It's not going to <laughs> Well, interestingly enough, Jumia now raised $150 million. So they raised $40 million from Minicom, the first, uh, no, from JP Morgan, the first, the first round. They read, the Minicom put another $300 million. So already half of it in cash. Uh, and and uh, recently, uh, MTN, I think, bought in another 100 or 150 million. So it's a company which has $500 million behind with a market cap of more than three years. And uh, Wired and Fast Company recently said it was sort of, it's, yeah, it's the yeah. next competitor to Amazon globally. Yeah, it's, so, it's insane. And they launch, they launch now how many? They have Uganda, they launch uh, Uganda, Ghana, Kenya, Morocco, Egypt, uh, Algeria, etc. So, so what I want to say here is that you get into a place like this, the first thing is like, it's not working, but but if you stay another couple of weeks and to start to understand a market and you, raise, you get the right people behind, you see that it's working. And the same, I mean, we started this company, we were in a, in a hotel room for three days, and then, uh, and then uh, we started saying to interview other people, and three weeks later we moved into a house, and in that house was the office, and uh, the office, and um, uh, we were sleeping there, and <coughs> we in the warehouse because we started to buy washing machines and TVs and stock them in the, in the hallway of the house. Yeah, why we're doing that? Why, you know, like Naspers with Kalahari, they spent one year to travel business class to, uh, to Lagos, spent gazillions, and then after one year they realized that this, you know, they spent too much money and they closed down. So there's a difference between, you know, launching, building entrepreneurial ventures where you are like, you know, like ants and you do it, you know, no one knows, you do it fast, you do it uh, humble. And, and, and on one side, on, on the other side, big corporate spending millions and spending and sending, you know, uh, corporate guys uh, in five-star hotels and in, you know, business class flights, uh, a lot of blah, blah, and nothing happens. So, again, kind of like uh, the, the few things that I keep always in mind is people number one I mentioned, start entrepreneurial. Yeah? Um, keep everything variable. They exist for you. Whatever you build, it's, it's, it's risky, right? You, you don't know, you know, it may work, it may not work. 99% of the startups in this world fail. Right? So you, you have to keep everything variable, and uh, you know, uh, don't, uh, I'm telling to you know, all my teams all the time, do not invest in big warehouses and, uh, and big systems and SAP integrations and whatever, uh, higher expensive advertising agencies. Uh, but you know, keep it keep it variable in early stage until you see that it's working. And when it's working, then you need to start really building. Then you need data, and then you need systems. I would say it's kind of the very like two different stages. And rather, big companies do uh, do mistakes to you know instead of first building processes manually, they start with systems. So they bring the systems before the before the processes, and that's a big mistake. I mean, I've been doing seven years of consulting and. I remember huge budgets of SAP implementation, I don't know what other systems. None of them, but no single project that I've seen was finished in time and in the budget. A lot of them realized after three years that it's just not working, so I scrapped the business. Um, so basics, I mean, get, get the basics. I always do and think and tell people, get the basics right. The other important thing is data. And uh, I know that you know you, you, uh, you come from a kind of very creative environment, uh, um, um, and, and you may not be uh, always looking at data, but data is very important when you get to business. And whatever you run, I think, is data. Numbers do not lie. And um, data, I mean, analyzing data, understanding your customers means data. One thing that we're doing lately in Style 36 and Firefox and Kinero, we're we're using a lot of email marketing. Like you send newsletters you know, like crazy. You send seven newsletters a week. Uh, you do a lot of uh, search engine marketing, uh, or search engine, uh, you do a lot of Google 
uh, you know, uh, and, and display and remarketing and retargeting. So you get a lot of data from, from whatever. You know, you, know, you know what people purchased, when did they purchase, how often do they purchase. Uh, you understand the reaction. Even if you do like um, um, about the line advertising, you can always put a code in your print app and understand, you know, who redeems that code. You know, uh, what channels do they? Uh, what channel the customers come from? Do they come from a print ad? Do they come from a or from a Google ad? Do they come from a, you know a banner on you know displayed somewhere else? So there's a lot of data that a lot of companies do not utilize for. Because this data tells you who is a customer and. Um, Data can come from a lot of things. We're using even the, in the, you know, the people who are calling, the customer service. Um, uh, they, they tell, you know, um, I live in Johannesburg and I'm super interested by this shirt. Uh, tell me, tell me, whatever, tell me, you know, do you have the right size? So we're scanning the messages, the, 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 the little messages, or the, the emails the customers were sending us, uh, and get pieces of that messages into the database. To so build a, actually a database with you know, I'm a million, I live in Cape Town, I'm uh, whatever, I do this, I like movies, and I buy this kind of uh, product, and I buy it this often, you know, every three months or every four months, and the, the price that I pay is this much, and uh, my average basket size is this much. So you build this data. Uh, and this, I, I think it's super interesting here, because you work in, in, in marketing, right? And you build this data, and you can use it afterwards to, to improve the, um, uh, the efficiency of the marketing budget that you spend, right? Uh, instead of just spending, uh, you know, blindly, you spend exactly what you uh, what you what you should uh, to maximize the the dollar value of your uh, of your clients. Um, the other thing, um, so getting back to kind of the, the, the recipe of of uh, building venture. So I, I mentioned about about people. I mentioned about you know, hungry, aggressive, and then and fast and bold people. Um, you know, when you work with uh, when you work with people who are data oriented and coming from various places in the world, uh, you know, landing in, a, in Cape Town or landing in Lagos and uh, having them to work, you realize very fast I mean, who's good and who's not good. And the good people are actually the people who, you know, the risk takers and, and the people who are aggressive, yeah. but positive aggressiveness. So they want to build something, they want to be number, number one. Yeah. Being, being number one is, is all, is, is, Super, super important. Details. Um, I've met other people in my life and people who manage big companies, and um, you know they sit in the ivory tower and they think super strategically and they think you know what will happen in the world in ten years from now. Well, ten years from now, you know maybe a car will drive over us and uh, we kill us. Yeah. We don't know what's happening in ten years. Yeah, we, we know what's happening today. We know what's happening in the next one month, and we kind of. Uh, try to assume what's happening in one year from now. And, and I think present is super important and the near future is very important. If you do not do that now, there is no 10 years. So I strongly believe in details. And uh, I strongly believe in, 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 analytical, in analytical mindset. And, and that's what helps when you start things which are risky and, and don't care what in 10 years is too late. Um, failure. Yeah. It's, it's no problem to fail. And, other people are scared of failures. I mean, failures, they come. You know, you always, you launch 10 companies, two will work amazingly well, and you're gonna exit and sell them, and you're gonna make a lot of money. Three may survive, and the rest will close, will die. So it's always like this. Failure is accepted, and, 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 uh, and what's important here is learn from mistakes. Yeah. When you start uh, any kind of company, and you do, you do mistakes all the time. Yeah, I, I'm not, I wouldn't be upset if someone does a mistake. I would be super upset if someone does a mistake once, twice, third time, and never learns. Um, flex, flexible, yeah, try it. Make decisions fast. So there, there are two ways of making decisions right, in life. You, know, you, can, uh, you make a decision based on feelings. I, I think that this cool shirt will, will sell well. Um, or I know that this shirt will sell well because I've seen other people selling it and it sold this much at this value, at, at, uh, et cetera. So you always try, I'm trying to make, and I'm telling you people to make decisions based on, on numbers first and, and on feelings second. Um, I think one of the, one of the uh, the guys I used to work for a, while, a long time, who, run, who runs uh, Rocket Internet, uh, Oliver Sandberg, who's saying all the time, um, run a company like you run a bakery. Yeah, you bake early morning, 
uh, you stay during the day and, uh, and you count your money during the night. And uh, this learning, we apply this in the Latin Groupon, which is, which is a sales organization. And uh, when we're running sales team in Groupon, um, you know, you meet with them at 8 o'clock in the morning and you ask them, you know, what are the customers, what are the deals that, that we have to go through there. And we talk about the, you know, the various mentions. They go into the field, they run, they sign the deals, they get back into afternoon, in, in the afternoon. At 2 p.m. you meet them again, you see again what, what they have done, and you measure their performance, and, and you close in the evening. So it's very kind of like process, process way of, um, of running teams, and, uh, and that, that's what's working. Um, so execution, I think uh, execution is, uh, is very, very important. Huh? Um, you know, I'm, I'm meeting a lot of entrepreneurs and investors lately, and everyone talks about a lot of ideas. And you know, friends of mine, they have great, creative, amazing ideas, but but only one percent of those guys they really go and then and then do the internet, and they take the risk to do it. And um, I think execution is uh, is, is key. Um, so can I put together a slide here with what, kind of like what are the big processes in any kind of startup, in internet startup, probably mostly in an in a e-commerce uh, company. So data is first. So you think of you know, decision making, uh, analytics. Yeah, if you, if you use, just think of Google Analytics, right? You always use Google Analytics or, or for apps you use other things uh, to get you to get your data about, about the, the, the campaigns that you run and the customers. Um, On-site optimization super important. Whatever if you have if you have a digital clients, you know, they, they they may always talk about A/B testing and why the buy button there is there is not there. Why is this big? It's not this big. So try a lot. Try to improve to improve customer uh, customer purchase. Um, technology is also important. I mean, a lot of people put uh, put money in, in building platforms and websites. And I think it's kind of the some, something which is given. You know, uh, you can always start with a Magento website and then getting bigger afterwards. Uh, but 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 this is I mean this is more important than the uh, the IT side. Um, you know, today in our days, uh, you can build platforms to uh, be affordable. Um, in, in the in the online marketing side, you know, there, you have all the channels that you always use. You, uh, you know, search engine, the paid pay per click channels. SEO is super important. Uh, but it takes a while to build. Um, so start this your when we launch when we're launching Zandu actually we came with a name kind of uh, two months before we launched and then we built we built a, a coming soon page and we built some content on it and we started to, to build SEO before the company was launched. Um, you know, display affiliates uh, also important channels. And the rest the other side is operations, right? You have a product, you keep it in a warehouse, uh, where we buy it from a supplier, you keep it in a warehouse and you sell it. Yeah, so it's, it should work like a, like a clock. So again, if you think of a process, you start from buying the products, keeping the warehouse, market the product, uploading it on a website, and, and, and sell it and analyzing what you, what you sell. So it's very, again, it's very process, um, very process oriented. Um, back, to, back to online, uh, back to online retail. So, what, what I believe that uh, it will be looking going into the next uh, years. Yeah. So if today it looks like this, uh, uh, and okay, in South Africa it's much different because it's pretty, you know, it's, you have all those big uh, on, offline retailers, new ones to work, they've been here for 100 years. Um, but, but retail becomes more and more multi-channel. So, you know, you guys go today, you buy a product online, you may pick it in a store, you may buy it on your mobile. Um, this is becoming more and more multi-channel. And um, a lot of studies show that uh, the front store will, will shrink more and more. And if you still travel now to London or to Tokyo or to uh, uh, in Shanghai or Beijing, you see in the subways like big, big, big uh, posters and you can start scanning the QR codes and automatically it adds to your cart on your application and it can be shipped the product home. So, the, the kind of the store itself is becoming smaller and smaller, while the behind of the store is becoming bigger and bigger because you know stores need to start fulfilling, packing goods, shipping them to your home. Uh, mobile shopping is 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 huge. Do you do you shop? Uh, I mean, do you shop online? Do you shop on mobiles? I guess. I guess you do. Uh, mobile shopping is becoming huge. Um, people use you know various platforms to uh, same day delivery. 
uh, but but the, the part which is behind all this stuff is is, uh, is data, it's big data. How to use this data? How to analyze it properly um, in order to sell more and to maximize the results? Yeah. So, because um, I spent I spent uh, you know, three years and a half, four years in, in Africa, um, always we're looking at what are the countries where it's really interesting to do something. I mean, South Africa is great. It's a very super civilized country. You feel here like you feel in anywhere else in, in the in the Western world. Uh, unless you go somewhere in the countryside, but but you, you, when you travel in Africa and you go to Kenya, where and you go to Lagos or you go to, to Cameroon, you realize that it's totally different. So how can is that is that a market? Is that a good market to sell anything? You can to sell products, to sell online or offline, and and um, and you start looking into why I would go to Nigeria to do business, yeah. any kind of business. And let's take the, the typical online internet. Why do we launch Jumia in Nigeria? And um, one thing in Nigeria is that there is no, there is no uh, proper offline internet. There, is, there, there was two years ago, uh, two years ago there, was two, there was two checkers in Lagos, 20, 20 million people a city. Two checkers. There's no place to go and buy food, to go and buy groceries, or buy any kind of other things, you know, besides the small street vendors. And they were taking three hours to travel from one from here to the airport in Cape Town, yeah, because the traffic is crazy. So you realize in here, well, that's maybe a good, good place to, uh, to do something else than, than offline retail and then launching an online retail, maybe a good idea. Even the internet penetration is very small, even, but people are on mobile. Yeah. All, you know, the, the smartphone penetration in Nigeria is huge. It's much bigger than people. Um, so that's what we're looking at in Lagos, and that's what was kind of number one, number one decision of staying there or and building Jumia or, or leaving and taking our side. Um, but Africa is Africa is actually small. If you look at Africa in total, the the, the um, um, national the gross national product of all African countries is actually smaller than the one of UK. I think it's 80, 80 billion. Uh, Million dollars or something. It's actually very small. Yeah, South Africa and Nigeria make more and more than half of, of the rest of Africa. So, um, so actually in Africa currently there are only two countries which matter in, uh, in at least in online details: South Africa and Nigeria. And within those countries, there are 10, 10 big cities uh, with Star 36 and, and five rooms in, in South Africa. We're selling 95 percent of our products in Johannesburg and Cape Town. And Johannesburg was about two thirds of Cape Town. So, does it make sense to try to sell couches in Nelspruit? Maybe not, because you're going to spend way too much money and uh, you're going to sell it at, at a loss today. Durban, probably. Um, same for, for Nigeria, Lagos, Abuja. Same from, uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, for other countries. So, there are not many places where you can really, really uh, do a big piece. But again, that's today. And that's changing at a super rapid pace. Uh, like big guys like Jumia with, with Rocket behind and with, uh, with JP Morgan and with Medical now, they launched 40 countries. They launched the, the Jumia in 40 countries. So they put a lot of cash now, they kind of paved the roads. It's going to take one to two years, but then it's going to be the time to go there. The guys who go now, they lose money. And that's, that's my let's, let's let the other guys lose money, and then you come a bit later, and when the, the, the roads are paved, and then you, you do this. Um, Many challenges in Africa, like internet penetration. Imagine South Africa, if you look at the internet penetration in, uh, say, there are 50 million people in this country, right? There are about 17 million out of the 15, the 50 million, 17 million, one seven, who have access to a desktop uh, computer with internet, right? The rest are mobile. Out of the 17 million, guess how many people really purchase online? Any yeah, idea? Yeah. Okay, it's, it's less than 2 million. The less than 2 million people in South Africa have ever purchased some, a product online or a service. And half of those guys buy flights. Uh, so the population, the more kind of the, the, the internet addressable e-commerce population in South Africa is very small. That's growing at about 25% year on year. Um, so to sell a, a, a shirt online or a shoe online is, is not, it's, it's difficult right? because you don't have many people. So you spend the same money and effort here as you do in the US, but in the US you sell to 150 million people, while here you sell to 2 million. Um, but what's interesting in, in South Africa and also in other countries is that mobile is growing. Uh, so you have more and more people who get smartphones. There are about 2 million 
There are about 2 million smartphones now in sort of like real smartphones, about 1.2 uh, Androids and about 20,000 iPhones. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, Blackberries, there are 8 million Blackberries and they're, which are getting replaced by, by, pure, by Androids. Uh, so it is growing, so a lot of people start to, to get phones, they don't buy it. Yeah, they use their phones to, you know, to buy dates, to, to, uh, to, whatever, to do dating, to do information. My, my maid, for example, she has WhatsApp and she has a Galaxy X3. Uh, and I was asking her, so how do you, how do, you do it? Like, all my neighbors are the same, and she used to carry it. So those guys, they start having access to technology. They don't buy today, they may buy in two years from now. They, they won't have money now to buy a pair of shoes for, for, for 300 grand, 400 grand, but they will. So this is growing. And that's where, you know, in two years from now, I see really uh, uh, the, the mobile commerce uh, booming in this country. And you see the same trends uh, around in the other African countries. Yeah. The infrastructure is very difficult. Imagine shipping, um, you know, a, a, a box. In South Africa, it's simple, right? So you send in from your warehouse with a delivery company, it gets into a truck, it gets to the after in Johannesburg. So you can. Or, or you know, you ship your order in the morning and you get it later in the afternoon in Cape Town. You know, if you take a lot, for example, you should ship same day most of the products in, in Cape Town. But, um, but it's very expensive. To ship a, pro a, a package here for a company, if you think that you buy and take a lot free delivery, yeah, take a lot and pay probably 40 to 50 rand. In Cape Town, probably 40 rand. To Johannesburg, probably 80, 90 rand. So imagine the cost for a company for a retailer. Yeah, a retailer which makes a pretty small margin, you know, maybe take a lot, maybe makes 25% or 30% maximum of the products that they sell, most of the margin is eaten by the delivery cost. Uh, and, and this is working only when you, send, when you sell so many products on a daily basis that your incremental delivery cost and other costs get, get down. But imagine, imagine Lagos. There's no proper roads. There is a traffic like crazy. Um, so how do you do it? There is no proper delivery company unless you take DHL or FedEx and you spend uh, you know, fifteen dollars per package. So in Lagos, the first thing that we did was getting uh, getting people in the streets, interviewing them, people who have motorbikes, and uh, we hired twenty guys in, in a week. Uh, we didn't even even hire them actually. We, we rent kind of we were paying them on a daily basis, um, and they were shipping packages on the on the back of the motorbikes. And that's I mean you do it yourself. And get a big learning is in, mar in places where there is no proper infrastructure, uh, just do it yourself from scratch. And very often, you do it yourself much better than anyone else does it for you. Um, there are other things that we try, I mean, video content in, in, um, in, uh, in online retail, you see more and more that, uh, you know, instead of just having pictures on sites, uh, you start having videos, and we're measuring the impact of having a video you push a, a button and uh, you see someone wearing a clothes, uh, dressing up a shirt and wearing a shirt. And, uh, and you, you, you measure the conversion and you realize the conversion is much bigger because people spend more time on the site and people then start seeing other pages, etc. Uh, um, so again, back to Africa, so why, where do we think, where do I think that? It's a place to do business now, South Africa and Nigeria. You have Namibia a bit around. I mean, there's two and a half million people, very wide, pretty difficult to ship things there because uh, you know, it's, it's very, very big. But there's a, the, the people buying. We're spending about, uh, we're selling about two and a half percent of uh, products on, on both Zambia and Star 36 in, in Namibia. Um, I think Kenya is coming, but, uh, but it's going to be in a couple of years from now because Kenya is very mobile, um, but there's no. Um, I mean, the, the, the gross nature, the, 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 Kenya is not a rich country. There's no, there's no minerals, there's nothing. So people are pretty poor, so they use, uh, they, they are pretty connected, but they don't buy it uh, online. And then uh, in the rest of Africa, it's kind of, I mean, Mozambique, there's lack of total lack of product. So you think of, uh, you can sell there anything uh, as soon as people will start getting more money. Um, all the central and western Africa is the same. Um, the, the, rest of, the rest of Africa is still, uh, still very fragmented here. I'm not sure if you guys have traveled ever in, into the central or, or uh, uh, in, in, a, in a sub Saharan Africa, but it's super, super fragmented. It's you know, four, how many countries? 50 countries, different languages, different, uh, uh, super complicated to do uh, over border shipping, shipment because of taxes, because of you know, local governments which are very corrupt. And then uh, that's, that's probably that's going to be later on. 
Um, so, uh, kind of a, a quick uh, example of, uh, of what's important when, when, when you do a, when you start fashion all that. I got an example from uh, like Crystal 36 that, that I put together at a time. Um, so we started logistics in house, same like in Jumia. We didn't have a warehouse in the beginning, we're just storing in a, in a, in a, in a back room in the office. Um, we hired drivers here, so we hired actually 10 drivers in Cape Town and 10 in Johannesburg. Um, it was much more efficient, we were able to get the drivers to open the packages in front of the customers to show the pair of shoes, try it, if you don't like it, ship it back. So you, you cut actually all the return logistic, the reverse logistic cost, and the customer likes it. Uh, because you see the shoe, you like it, uh, the, the driver can sell. The, the, own, kind of the own delivery is super important because, um, because when, you, when you buy online, right, um, you don't have any contact with, with uh, you, you don't get into, don't step into a Truworth or a Woolworths and someone s tells you good morning, what you'd like to buy, it's nothing, right? You have a product on the side, you have a text, you may call a customer service and the guy will tell you whatever. Uh, but you don't see anyone. So having someone to, to uh, touch base with a customer physically is super important. And if that someone does it well, it's your kind of your ambassador. And in a market which is so small, that, you know, two million people ever purchasing something online, you cannot mess up with a customer. And you know it from you know from, from your advertising background. And you cannot mess it up. If the customer is is angry, he or she is not going to buy you. And you lose a customer, which is one small percentage of that of the market. Um, so, doing this kind of this physical physical contact with a customer was super super important to build uh, the brand awareness. Um, so this is all kind of all logistic side. On, on the product side, um, when you sell products online or offline, you need to buy them from a supplier. And the question is, you know, when you buy products and you store products, you may end up with buying things that no one, no one, buying things from a supplier and which no one is gonna buy. So you end up with millions and millions of brand in stock. You have to discount afterwards, you know, 50% off. You see like Zando 50% off, Star 36, 80% off, whatever. Because you can't sell them. So if you don't buy the right things, um, you do not sell them. And the question, how do you buy the right things? How do you know what would be the trend in 12 months from now? Yeah? Because purchasing from brands, maybe fashion, is, it's one, it's two seasons in advance, right? How do you know what styles, in what quantity, uh, uh, you'll be able to sell? It's a, it's a science, right? And this science is called planning. And there are people who kind of try to understand what are the, they look into other countries, which like Europe, for example, which is one season um, uh, in front of us and they try to plan. But it's not an easy thing because you can always be, be wrong. Um, so, um, so here data plays a very, again, data plays a very important role. Um, test, again, test. Buy small quantities in the beginning, try them, see what happens. Yeah, if you don't sell, if you don't sell, then stop. We're doing a lot of consignment, so trying to put the, the bar and the risk of stock into the hands of the suppliers. So we're not, and not to pay the stock for. Um, payments. Uh, I'm not sure if you know that this country is so, uh, if, if you look like the way South Africans pay, you, we assume that everyone has a credit card, right? And actually everyone has a credit card, that's fine. Or like a card, whatever, bank card or a debit card. But for, to people, for people to start paying online, uh, it's, uh, they don't trust. And you may, you may have the same feeling, yeah, do I, am I gonna put my credit card online if someone steals it? And a lot of people pay, are happy to pay cash if you offer them the opportunity to pay cash. And we saw that in, uh, I saw it in Russia, it's very similar to, to here. In Russia, it's 95% of the, of, the, of the retail online is actually cash. You know, you have a driver bringing you the package and you give cash to the driver. Um, and we tried this in South Africa, so we tried cash and delivery. We just tried it in Cape Town, 20 kilometers around Cape Town, and more than half of the purchases in that area, people were not paying. First, first, the first purchase, no, no card, cash. They were happy for the driver to come and give the cash. Second time, the same. Third time, the same people were paying by card. And the first conclusion that you get is, okay, so this guy has a credit card, has a card. Why they don't pay initially? Because they don't trust. They want first to trust the brand, and then you build it, and then they stand, you get it. 
and it's much cheaper for you uh, as a retailer to sell to use a credit to, to for the for the customers to pay by credit card, right? Because you don't need to send a driver and then take the risk, etc. So, so the important how you know think we're thinking how to you know adapt locally. Uh, if you can't just take a concept, put it here, then copy everything, then it's work. Local adaptation. Um, I mean, customer customer centric organization is it's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually very important. And I'm going to give an example of. Um, are, are you familiar with the notion of uh, Net Promoter Score? Are you guys using that? So that's a that's a that's a BCG build tool. It's been they built it like uh, 10, 15 years ago. And uh, the Net Promoter Score is a is a score which is um, which calculates the customer happiness. And the way uh, the way to it say. You take whatever twenty people in this meeting in this room, and um, I'm gonna ask you like, on a scale of one to ten, how 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 would you recommend my brand to your friends and family? And you're gonna say what? Well, ten, great. You're gonna say nine. You're then gonna say um, seven or eight, which is okay. And you're gonna say five. And you're gonna say two. I don't. I hate. It. Never gonna recommend it. And you calculate the score. You say whoever says nine plus or nine and ten, that's a promoter. So those are the guys who come back, who come back and buy because they love the brand, because they, they trust the brand. They're happy with the price, they're happy with the customer service. If you say seven or eight, you're okay. Now, if someone else, if I come with, a, with the same kind of the, the same product, but they'll be cheaper, you're gonna buy from me. So you are in, in this side. You, you don't. It's, it's, you're not. You're not buying from me because you you love. Me. And if you say if you say uh, seven or uh, less, uh, or six or less, uh, then you are uh, it's a detractor. So you really, you really don't, you really would not like to buy from me uh, if you find someone else because you don't like the brand. You just buy from me because because there's no other product in the market. No. So and then you calculate this score, which you say I'm gonna take all the promoters, so the people who said nine and ten, minus all the detractors, so the people who said um, uh, six or less, and you calculate the score. And that's something that a lot of companies in this world do, so it's, you can benchmark. So Apple, for example, they have a 75% to 80% NPS, meaning that you have 75% more people who said they love it versus they don't like it. Yeah? So there's a score, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, uh, Microsoft has probably a 60%. The bank, uh, FNB, probably minus 30. <laughs> no, FNB, FNB is a different company. Uh, uh, call it APSA. APSA is minus 30. Uh, so so banks, banks usually have a zero, or very small or negative NPS, so or more detractors, and so you work with a bank because uh, you know, because you have four banks in this country, and you don't really have the choice. But you love Apple because it's cool and because it's a great customer service. So we're having actually we started in uh, in the three companies in South Bay six were you know, five percent in the beginning, and we got to about thirty. Well, lately it was forty five percent. How do you do that? Uh, you you make sure that your customer is happy, and that's super super important. Again, in, in a, such a small market, and how do you make sure you you know you you teach them over the phone, you help them if they call they call you and they tell you they tell you I want to return the product because I don't like it, you accept it, and there are many things that you can do to uh, to make the customer happy. It is very much it, uh, keeps very much on the tone of the voice of the of how do you help them, right? Make them. I mean, uh, I was telling my, my my guys in the office we're working over the weekend. Because a customer was in Pretoria and said, "Well, I need that product, that, that pair of shoes for a wedding on a Saturday." And sorry, guys, but uh, it's not uh, you sent me the wrong the wrong pair of shoes. And we we're there to ship it, and there was a guy in Joburg who shipped it for overnight, and a guy drove to the customer to bring it. And the customer was always buying. So customer happiness is super important. Um, so back to kind of the back to the. Um, the operational stuff. Um, so I mentioned about you know customer satisfaction is probably number one thing when you when you build a venture. And a lot of people do mistakes. Like with, with Rocket Internet, where the, the philosophy was the philosophy was let's launch very fast, Sando and Jumia and everything. We don't really care. Let's launch it and then go go fast. And then you know six months later, we're gonna raise money from JP Morgan and then. We don't really care about the customer, just get as much as possible, like the fast, fast, fast. While you realize that this is uh, this is great on one side because you can you know can build 20 businesses overnight and then raise a lot of money and but when you ask your customers what do they think about you, it's a completely different story. And uh, again, you cannot mess up with the customers. And lately, 
to completely change a strategy where we tried still to go fast, but in the same time being sustainable. And, um, and um, um, the, um, the competitors, this is a very competitive market. In you know, 2 million people here, you have you know, 20 companies trying to sell the same things to those people. How do you do that? And uh, this, this, this is very much related to uh, the service model. You can always say, OK, Star 36 is a bit more, was a bit more upscale, and Zando is pretty uh, you know, kind of mid to low. And, but this is bullshit. Yeah? By the end, if you look at the products, everyone sells the same products. Yeah? They package it a bit differently. They have uh, some, some, uh, you know, some uh, more niche brands, but it's the same thing. How do you differentiate in the way you, the way you, uh, you uh, make your customers? It's a selection, but it's also it's the customers. And it, how do you, you know, what do you offer? Do you offer a business <coughs> service that the other guy doesn't offer? Um, so, um, yeah, the other thing that we were looking into the customer satisfaction was, you know, Hello Peter is very huge, and it's very big in South Africa, right? If you don't like something, everyone goes to Hello Peter and say, you know, Shit brand, I don't want to buy, no one buys from here. So we're looking into, into complaints, and uh, we're analyzing why people complain. And the main, the main reason of complaints was actually not that you know, the product was not cool or the price was not good. It's actually the delivery. Yeah? I ordered it today. I was supposed to get it tomorrow by 4 PM. I haven't got it. I have a waiting the day after tomorrow. What do I do? Uh, so it's basic things, really basic. Keep customer promise. If you promise that you ship it by tonight and get by tomorrow, should get them. And we're mentioning, we're trying to see, you know, those are the so those are the the, the complaints. And it's the complaints here. We analyze them from Jan to October, and the number of complaints was steady, while the sales were uh, went ten times uh, uh, bigger than in the beginning. So meaning that the complaints remain steady while you you uh, you sell much more. And the main important thing is that they leave the complaints related to delivery, which were actually in the beginning, 100% of all the complaints. In the end, actually, they were like really going down. Um, so, and this, how did we achieve that? Through pure operation excellence. Yeah. Ship on time, ship a product, you order a, a red chair, you don't send the customer a yellow chair. That's why, because there's so many issues where you have customers saying, I ordered this chair, but it was a completely different color. So, how can I was trying to understand, you know, going to the warehouse and trying to understand the process there to understand how on earth can the, the shipping guy in the warehouse take the wrong chair when he has the, the image of the chair on the computer and the proper barcode. It happens. Um, so there's kind of like a lot of information here, but but in, in summary, in summary, building ventures, whatever are they, are they e-commerce or or you know cool. Uh, applications, people is number one, get the right people, customer is number two, make sure that the customer is happy and use it. And the rest is kind of customers. So it's pretty much, um, it's pretty much everything on my side. Cool. Yeah, any, any questions, any, yeah? Um, why do you do all of this? Because <laughs> I love it. It's fun, it's, um, I, I just like building. It's like, you know, it's like a, um, you have uh, in the world of building houses, actually I'm passionate by building also by building apartments and you have architects, the people who come with the idea concepts and the people who build. Yeah? And the people who take or afterwards take the apartment and take care of it. I think on, on my side I'm, I like uh, the architecture but I also like the building. So I like the detail, the operations, the, I want to see what happens. You know, when you build something I want to see, I wanna see the, the, the results of what, what I do. Was it was it scary like leaving a very stable job and like regular salary behind and taking the plunge the first time? <laughs> yeah, definitely. So mostly when you're in Europe, and you know you you know that if you lose your job, you still get your salary for another two years without doing anything. Oh, that's uh, wrong. That's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that's still the law. Yes. Yeah, and you work thirty-five hours a week in France, and if you work thirty-six, so people are unhappy. That's wrong. Uh, no, yeah, it's 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 uh, you. you I think it stays very much on also on, uh, on how the people are built. So they are risk takers and they're less risk takers. I'm, I'm a risk taker and I, I like taking risks because I know if there, there is no risk, there is no rewards. And okay, I like I like the salary. The salary you can always leave with no salary for a few months, but uh, the upside of this can be, can be huge. Yeah. 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 Y
in not only in, in, in financial upside, but in, in what you build, because you're gonna be, you, you're gonna, there is something there that you created, and you, you created something which changes, which may change the life of those people. Yeah? You may always argue that selling fashion online or selling uh, furniture online may not change your life, but, uh, but there are so many things that you can do in, in, in this country, in this continent, to change, really change the life. Yeah, so with, for example, uh, with, with, this po with Pocket Plan, the, the, the application, that, uh, the, the event application that we just launched uh, two, years, two weeks ago in Cape Town, it's not really changing the life, but it, it gives people a different way of uh, a way of finding what's cool in town and buying immediately the event. Yeah, you want to go out, you want to go to a cool concert, you don't know what's happening. You know, the cool jazz concert downtown Long Street, you don't know about it. You go on an application, you, you buy it, you buy the ticket in, in two seconds, and you go. So this is really changing something in the, in the, in the way people do things. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, I want to talk about the question on Pocket Plan. How are you making a profit from it? Do you get, you get uh, a cut. percentage from it? Yeah, I get a percentage yes. of, the, of, the, of the ticket. Uh, I mean, that's, it's a huge market because there's so many events uh, that um, you don't know about them. If you go to Comfy Ticket or Web Tickets, right, those, those are those, like catalog sites, right? You you'd go there because you want to go buy an M&M, right? You know that you want to go to M&M and you buy a ticket. But there's so many event organizers and small parties, private events, uh, cool things, really, really cool things happening in town, and no one knows about them unless you start to look into Cape Town Magazine or whatever else. So this gives you immediately. It's like Uber, right? You know, why do I take a taxi versus Uber? Because Uber, I click the button, the car, the car comes in two minutes, I know exactly where the driver is, okay? And I get to, I get home, maybe a bit more expensive in the case of Uber, but, but it's great. How do you personally sort of define success for your company? Is it more kind of like personal happiness? Or is it, is it a mix of that and it making lots of money? It's, I mean, I think money is not, Always, I mean, if you have investors behind, right? So you have to make them happy and you have to give them a, 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 an upside of their investment. But I think, I think financial uh, rewards is, is, is a secondary thing. Is is seeing that the the thing that you build exists, serves a need, and, and grows, and is there, is there. So so far, which ones? Which one's made you the happy? Well, I think, look, uh, Group One was amazing. I mean, Group One is the biggest, when we started a company with, with three people, okay, when we sold it to a six people, and now it's 150 people, or 170. And even if, you know, there, there, there is a lot of polemic around Group One, whether or not it's a good concept, and whether or not it's good to ship, to sell ship stuff, is there, it's selling, is the biggest retailer in this country. It's twice as big as Calhai, it's in terms of volume of, uh, Still? yeah, it's the biggest. Uh -huh. yeah. So, uh, and that's, that's, uh, I think that was a big success. Um, some other things like uh, like Windu in China did not survive. I mean, it was running for two years, but then we closed down long after we left. Uh, but you know, this is the, some countries it's very difficult to do business, and if you are not local, it's just not working because you don't understand properly the market. Um, I mean, other companies like Sando, uh, you know, pretty successful. What's your next big thing? <laughs> Um, well, I mean, uh, working on a number of projects now um, that will hopefully come to life in, uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, it's always like, you know, you think of what, what's the next thing, so you start with like 10 ideas and you brainstorm with people and with investors and you think what are the three uh, best ideas of those ones and you always try to check, check boxes. Why is it a good idea? Because it's big enough, because it solves a need, because, you know, uh, can be expandable easily into other markets, maybe into Africa. Uh, so, uh, so Pocket Plan is one of the one thing that we uh, we launched uh, we launched um, uh, Bogota actually, uh, and uh, we're going to launch other countries uh, in the next quarter.